Hello everyone, welcome to the SIUK India webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We are now live with Dharam University. Today we have Patrick with us. He will be taking us through this webinar. We'll answer all the questions after the presentation during the Q&A session. So let's start the webinar. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you. Let me start by sharing my, my screen. Thank you for the kind introduction and welcome to this webinar. I appreciate uh, the time that you're taking uh, with us today to hear about Durham University and in particular, the School of Government and International Affairs. My name is Patrick Kuhn. I'm a professor in comparative politics in the School of Government and International Affairs, and I am the director of education in charge of all of our undergraduate and postgraduate programs. And today I will be talking to you particularly about our postgraduate programs. So what am I going to talk about? Uh, I will talk first about why you should choose to come to Durham and why you should come to Skia. I understand that most of you will have many excellent choices, but I try to convince you in this brief in, uh, presentation of why Durham is the right choice for you. I will then talk about our various postgraduate programs, how they're structured, what you can expect if you come and study with us. As you can see, they range from international relations to political and international theory, over to more regional specialized programs in the Middle East, to peace and security studies, and excitingly, a new program that is starting in 25-26, our Masters in Public Policy. I will then end briefly outlining how to apply and what scholarship opportunities there are before I am happy to answer any questions that you have. So please feel free to write down your questions uh, and uh, make them available so that um, we can get to your questions as soon as possible. So Durham is located in the Northeast of England. Uh, the Northeast is a, um, an area with a rich cultural history uh, and Durham in particular uh, is an old medieval market town with a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site uh, on a peninsula surrounded by the River Weir. As you can see from the photo, the reason for this UNESCO uh, World Cultural Heritage Site is the tremendous cathedral that we have that was built in the 12th century and was one of the first cathedrals in Europe to be built with a stone roof. In fact, the university kind of sprung out of this cathedral and in particular out of the castle, which you can see in the further background, which was the original uh, location of the university in the 19th century. Durham is on the East Coast Main Line, so it has a direct train connection to London and in less than three hours you are in London and in less than two hours you are in Edinburgh. We are about 15 minutes away by train from Newcastle, which is the largest city uh, in the Northeast. Durham's claim to fame, at least in the popular culture, is that it was uh, the place where Harry Potter was shown. This is a scene from the movie, as you can see, and this area is in the cloisters, just in this little green area here uh, off the cathedral where Harry Potter and his friends learn uh, to uh, do magic. Durham offers a rich student experience. It is obviously a world-class academic institution. We are ranked within the top 100 of the world universities, and we are ranked within the top 50 uh, in terms of employer uh, reputation globally. Durham University is the third oldest English university uh, and therefore has a collegiate system, meaning that there are colleges and there are academic uh, departments. Unlike other universities with collegiate systems, however, there is a quite strict divide between colleges and departments where most of the academic learning will happen in departments. The colleges in Durham are really a home away to home, uh, away from home, a place to make friends for life, to uh, get uh, support, pastoral support, to experience uh, things that are outside of the academic realm. And when you are in Durham, you will have the opportunity to do a variety of things, ranging from sports to arts, uh, to debates, academic stuff, etc. And you will always find someone within your college that will share your interests and will be eager to participate in uh, these events. 
Our colleges are generally mixed. There are 16 of them. Most of them are mixed, but there is one postgraduate only college. So if you prefer not to be in a college with undergraduates, you can choose to have a college that has a purely postgraduate uh, experience. There is a breadth of extracurricular activities, many of them happening in the colleges. There are many competitions between colleges, both within debating societies, uh, but also within sports. And in particular, we have one of the best sports complexes in uh, the UK. In fact, in 2023, uh, we were uh, elected to be the sports university of the year. The sports complex is just outside of the city, uh, about a five minute uh, walk from campus. And it has uh, land hockey fields, football fields, cricket fields. It has uh, indoor facilities. It has a huge gym. It has fencing, indoor cricket, a rowing tank. And because Durham is located at a river, there is, of course, lots of uh, water sports activities and rowing on the river uh, as well. Uh, the city of Durham is uh, a small university city. It has a historic medieval city center, and it offers particularly good value for money. So unlike many other places uh, in the UK, which are quite expensive, because of its remote location, your stipend and money are likely to go much further at Durham than in any other university town. It is also the uh, in the five top safest places in England and Wales uh, to study. The school itself, the School of Government and International Affairs, is a top 100 uh, school in politics and international relations, and we are the eighth ranked school uh, in the Complete University Guide of 2024. Even though Durham might be remote, uh, the school really is a cosmopolitan community. Over half of our academic staff, including myself, uh, are not academic, are not uh, British nationals, and we have students from over 50 countries ranging from all across the, the continents, from North America, Latin America, South America, Europe, uh, South Asia, Africa, and uh, East Asia. I'm particularly proud that our, about our graduate employability. We are the seventh in the UK uh, for politics graduates prospects. So our programs really help place uh, our graduates in great career opportunities. So where do our graduates go? Many of them go into the public sector, local and national governments, both internationally, but also within the UK. The civil service uh, in the UK, but also in other countries around the world. In fact, uh, our graduates in the Middle East uh, program are the largest number of graduates in the um, foreign office in the UK at the moment. Uh, and many also stay within academia, pursuing a PhD uh, and becoming an academic either in their home countries or uh, anywhere across the world. We have several um, graduates that are in international uh, organizations, but also in non-governmental organizations. And of course, some graduates go into the private sector, in particular with regard to political risk analysis, the financial industry, and consulting and accounting, as well as uh, media. So why should you come and uh, study at SKIA? Well, there are two main reasons. The first is we offer a wide range of substantive programs and approaches. So within the school, you will have programs, not just in international relations, but also in peace and security, in programs with regional expertise and in public policy. This is somewhat unique for a UK university in the sense that all these programs are housed in one department. So you will be able to meet students from different programs, interact with students from different programs. For example, in our weekly student staff coffee morning, which is not common where in other universities you often have a department for international relations, a department for politics and government, and a school of public policy where students then don't really meet across those different programs. We don't teach politics and international uh, relations from just one particular methodological approach, 
but we offer different methodological approaches spanning normative, conceptual, qualitative, quantitative, and computational approaches. So no matter whether you already know what approach you like and what you would like to study, or if you just want to explore different approaches, you will find a way of studying these topics and current affairs and the pressing problems of the global world uh, within our school. We also have a really vibrant research culture. Our school is all research active and all of our academic members not only teach, but also publish in world leading journals. We have several research centers. And as I go through the programs, you will see how these different research centers are tied to the specific programs, giving you an academic home, not just to do your studies in, but also to engage with a wider set of academics with cutting edge research and the various outside speakers that these centers bring uh, to Durham. We have a very inclusive student-centered learning approach geared towards employment and uh, further study. So we are keen to involve students in all aspects of our programs and all levels. In particular, uh, we have an institutionalized student involvement through the Student Staff Consultative Committee, where we meet with students at least once a term and hear what their concerns are and try to address those as we go forward, but also learn more generally from our students on how to evolve and improve our programs. There's a broad range of SCIA specific student support. For example, we have a first generation scholars network but we also have a network of international students that will help each other uh, acclimatize to the UK context and to the way that uh, academia works within the UK. All of our teaching is really active learning based. So we do not just kind of lecture at you from the front and you take notes and then maybe we have a discussion in a seminar. But what we try to do is to give you readings that will ensure that everyone in the class is at the same level, and then go through various exercises using simulations, group tasks, problem solving skills, etc. And we take these active approaches forward to our assessments where we don't just have you write one essay after the other, but try to give you authentic assessments, assessments that mimic things that you might have to do in a, in a future career. So you will, for example, have to create presentations, you will have to work in teams, uh, you will have to uh, maybe do a podcast, a mapping exercise, write a policy brief, um, or a variety of different forms of assessments that uh, are more closely related to the types of things that you will be doing uh, in, a, in a career. There are lots of career and research focused events. As I already mentioned, the research centers bring in uh, tons of external speakers, hold workshops and conferences, but we also every year bring back uh, our recent graduates three, four years down the line to speak to our students to hear what is important in getting into those sectors, into those industries, how did they get in? Uh, what were the things and the skills that we taught in our programs that were really useful for them? Uh, what does it actually mean to work for an NGO or work for an IO? What does the, uh, an, an average day look like, uh, et cetera? So let me um, introduce you to the offer that we have in terms of our postgraduate uh, programs. There is the International Relations Program, the Political International Theory uh, Program, the Middle Eastern Program, the two programs on the peace and security side, and then is starting in 25-26, the MSc Public Policy. I will go through each of these programs now briefly to kind of give you an overview of how they relate to the research center in the school, but also how they're structured and what you can expect. So let me start with the MA International Relations and the MA Politics and International Relations bracket political theory. Those two programs really have three things that make them uh, unique. The first is that they're unrivaled in breadth. 
So you have a variety of theories, concepts, and empirical approaches being taught in those programs. They don't just look at you know, the international or the global sphere, but they look at how local problems fester, might become regional, what national politics means for the interaction between states and how different states in international institutions address global problems. They will also approach these questions through a variety of epistemological approaches. So we don't just have uh, the, the positivist approach where we kind of describe and explain the world in scientific terms, but we will also talk about uh, normative and ethical uh, reasons. Why should we do certain things? How can we legitimize international power, uh, et cetera? There will be both thematic overviews covering various regions, but all of uh, the students in these two programs have the chance to not only study the broad range of international problems and global problems around the world, but specialize in a specific region to see how international relations manifests itself in this particular regional context. And these two programs are linked to two of our most active research groups and centers within the school, the Group for Research in International Politics and the Center for Political Thought. So how are these programs structured? If you are studying the MA International Relations, you will have two core modules that you will need to take. That is the International Relations Theory module and the International Organization module. They are uh, international relations oriented ones. The first one is more theoretically oriented. The second one is more empirically oriented. And then you will have uh, a dissertation, which is a 10,000 word uh, research project that you will work on in Epiphany and Easter term. You will then also have options that you can choose from. And as I highlighted, there is the option to specialize in the international relations of Europe, East Asia, or the Middle East. Or you can pick additional uh, modules from international relations or, and political theory realm. If you choose to do the MA politics and international relations political theory, you will have core modules in both international relations. Those are the two core modules that I've already introduced, the international relations theory and the international organization. And you will have two core modules uh, in ideologies and political thought or contemporary political philosophy, and you will have to pick one of the two things. So you can see in this second program that you could focus, uh, you could structure your degree to be very theory heavy, international relations theory, and then maybe ideologies and political thought, right? Or you could um, choose to have an, a more empirical approach with regard to international organizations, and then a more contemporary political philosophy uh, uh, approach to, to a program. You will then have a dissertation and it is green here because it's the combination of blue and yellow. So it will allow you to write a dissertation either in political theory or in international relations. And again, you have the option to choose, uh, you know, a regional module, Europe, East Asia, or the Middle East, um, and additional modules in international relations or political theory. This is one of our recent graduates, and, and as you uh, can see, uh, she's not only enthusiastic about what the program did for her in terms of uh, career, but it's, it's striking that in her testimony, she also mentions the interaction that goes on in these programs between staff and students, not only in our weekly informal regular meeting over coffee and some cake and cookies, every week, but also outside of classrooms, between lectures and between seminars. Let me now go to the MA Politics and International Relations of the Middle East, which is a new fully revised program uh, that we uh, are starting uh, this academic year. Uh, it is very timely given uh, the political context of what is going on in the Middle East that is likely going to shape uh, the future of the world over the coming uh, years and decades. The study of the Middle East has a long tradition uh, in Durham. In fact, it goes back to the uh, 19th century where the 
Institute for Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies was uh, founded at Durham. So it's one of the areas where Durham really has a great expertise and also great resources in terms uh, of archives. We have various experts within the school, both in terms of specific countries in the Middle East, but also in the broader thematic overview. And in addition, this program to the Middle East doesn't just cover Arabic states. So other Middle Eastern programs in the UK generally focus on the Gulf states, etc. But it covers countries beyond the Arabic world, in particular Turkey, Israel, uh, and, and Iran, which are important players. And as for any good regional program, it offers you the option to take an Arabic language module, allowing you to learn the language of the region that you are studying as well. The structure of the program is that you will have uh, three core modules in addition to your dissertation, the international politics of the Middle East, then in particular, the non-Arab states of the Middle East, uh, something that is unique to this particular Middle East program that gives you a view of how Israel, Turkey, Iran, uh, etc. Uh, interact and shape the politics of the Middle East. And you will have um, a module on researching the Global South, talking about in particular what the challenges are of doing social science research in the Global South and what uh, ethical implications uh, this has. In addition to your core modules, you will be able to choose a variety of options. As you can see, they range from uh, additional regional expertise in European politics, East Asia, further things in international relations, global governance, core concepts of political science, and then, as I mentioned, the Arabic language option. This program is tied to the Institute for uh, Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies. It is one of the oldest institutes, as I mentioned, and they have a variety of things they do to kind of engage uh, students, in particular postgraduate students, in their activities. Every year, IMIS organizes uh, guest lectures, research forums, symposiums with policymakers, in particular bringing the ambassadors of the region uh, in the UK up to Durham for an annual conference where PGRs and PGTs are postgraduate research students, so the PhD students and the postgraduate taught students, which are the master students, not only kind of can participate, but are actually actively leading and chairing uh, sessions. The next set of programs that I'd like to talk to you about are the programs in peace and security studies. And they are tied to the second institute we have within the School of Government International Affairs, which is the Durham Global Security Institute. It pursues research across the contemporary security and peace agenda, focusing on the interface between defense development and diplomacy, as well as uh, other areas from a more bottom-up approach relating to uh, peace building, but also conflict prevention. What makes these programs unique compared to the other programs is that they focus on a more intersectional approach between theory and practice and policy, right? They are also proudly multidisciplinary in the sense that they contain staff that are not just all political scientists or international relations scholars, but contain staff that have a sociology background, a law background, or an anthropology background to study uh, the emergence, evolution, and resolution of conflict in a variety uh, of contexts. And in particular, what makes them really unique, I think more widely, not just within Durham, but across the UK, is that they kind of teach in conjunction with practitioners and experts. So throughout this program, you will have so-called continuing professional development modules, CPD modules, which are co-taught by an academic member of staff from the department and a practitioner combining those two different lenses of like what theory and empirics say and how that actually unfolds in practical uh, reality. In addition to that, it also gives you contact to practitioners and uh, the ability to interact with them and hear of how they got into these positions, of um, what kind of 
pressing needs they have, etc. So how does this uh, program work? So both of these programs, the MSC Defense uh, Development and Diplomacy, which has a top-down approach to conflict, and the MSC Conflict Prevention and Peacebuilding, which has a more bottom-up approach, have two common core modules that you will take in your first term. Then uh, the Defense and Diplomacy uh, group goes on and takes two additional core modules in international law, post-conflict reconstruction and state building. And the MSC peace process goes on and looks at the peace processes, everyday political negotiations, and the consolidation of peace after violence. In the third term, they come together again in this capstone exercise, which is a humanitarian uh, simulation, where you simulate a humanitarian crisis and kind of bring the theory and knowledge and everything that you've learned to life. And over the summer vacation, you will then write your dissertation. And as you can see, along those three terms are those CPD modules, which are intense two-day taught workshops on a particular topic of which you can choose uh, what three of them to do uh, in, in the different terms. The choices there are, are quite wide ranging. They go from you know, conflict sensitive program management, conflict analysis to transitory lives, gender in the UN global security agenda to curating human remains, capturing and counting peace and conflict, defense engagement and entrepreneurship to a new CPD, which you're starting next academic year, which is conflict and the climate crisis. This is uh, one of our graduates from the program. In fact, he used to work for an NGO in, in Armenia uh, and then came here uh, to study this program and is now back uh, in Armenia and is working in the civil service in Armenia uh, and uh, came back just uh, when uh, the conflict about Ber uh, Karabakh uh, started again. And uh, in recent conversations I've had with him said, it was just very, very helpful to kind of have this background and this network, not just in terms of former graduates, but also in terms of people on the ground in different international organizations and NGOs he met during his time at Durham when, when dealing with uh, that conflict. Now, the last program I would like to talk to you about is the MSC Public Policy. It is a completely new program that we are launching and starting in 25-26. So it will not be available next academic year, but you can apply to this program next academic year uh, and join us in September 2025. This program has uh, three unique features in the sense that first, it really is an interesting combination between public policy foundation, so the, the, the bread and butter of public policy, of models of how they work, not just in the UK, but in a general global sense, but then also giving you really hands-on experience of uh, a, a, of a module which is called the capstone module which will pair groups of students with external organizations in order to address a specific policy program set by that organization so the organization will act as a client will tell you this is the problem that we have or this is the issue that we would like you to work on you will then get a terms of reference similar to how this works in the real world you will then work under the guidance of uh, an academic uh, on that problem, and you will present your solution and receive feedback from uh, that external organization. This not only gives you hands-on experience, but again, gives you this practical notion that will improve your employability and will also get you into contact with people working in the public policy sector. More and more now, uh, policy needs to be evidence-based, which requires students to have a good set of data analysis skills. When we speak to employers, we often hear that uh, they can find people on the job market that can either do data analysis, but don't know how to actually interpret and, um, and um, uh, explain them to non-data uh, experts, 
or they can find people that uh, are good at interpreting them, but can't really do them. And so this program really tries to kind of give you both. It gives you both training in how to actually do the data analysis that you need to have the evidence base to make these policy decisions, but also train you on how to interpret them and how to communicate them to decision makers and policymakers that might lack uh, those data analysis skills. It is tied to the largest research center within the school, which has over 14 members of staff, the Center for Institutions and Political Behavior. And given the size, has colleagues that have expertise, not just in a particular region of the world, but across multiple regions of the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, and North America, as well as Europe. So this is how the program works. So in your first term, you will have uh, the core public policy module, and you get to choose some public policy or politics options to go along with it. And then if you are a beginner, a novice, someone that hasn't done lots of data analysis before, you will get the opportunity to kind of learn the basics of data analysis in the quantitative methods and analysis course. If you are already quite experienced and advanced in your data analysis skills, you will take the full stack research design module and you will get to choose some data science options to go along with it. In the second term, what we call the epiphany term uh, and the Easter term, the third term of our academic year, in the public policy area, you will take the capstone module, the module that gives you that hand-on experience of working with a real world client on a policy problem in a, in a small group, as I've mentioned. And you will start working on your dissertation in public policy along with public policy and politics options that you can choose from. On the data analysis side, we will introduce you to causal inference. So the type of data design, the research designs that allow you to draw causal inference and to identify whether a policy really worked or didn't work. That is uh, the last aspect, the evaluation aspect of public policy. Uh, before you then go and apply those data analysis skills, both in the capstone module, but also in your dissertation in public policy. As I've said, this is a new program. Um, if you are interested in uh, keeping up to date and hearing from us when there is uh, information about the program and how to sign up for the program, please take a, a photo or a copy of this QR code which will lead you to a form where you can uh, leave your contact details and we will get into contact with you in the fall, winter uh, this year when sign up for this program starts and when there will be more detailed information sessions held on that program. So let me end by kind of giving you a quick overview of how the admissions and process works at Durham and how scholarships work. So you apply uh, at any time during the year. Uh, ideally, you should get your application in by the end of July in the year that you would like to start. So if you're planning to come and join us at Durham in September this year, then you would need to submit by the end of July so that we have a good time to look at your application and you have enough time to ensure that uh, you have the necessary visas, et cetera, in order uh, to join us here at Durham. The application portal is at the link uh, given here. Uh, and there are two key documents that you will need for most of our programs. That is your undergraduate transcript and a personal statement indicating uh, why you would like to study this particular program, why here at Durham and how this program relates to your future career plans. In terms of eligibility criteria, you will need to have a three, four, or five-year bachelor degree from an approved Indian university with average scores of 60 to 70 percent, depending on uh, the institution. And there are certain English language requirements that you will need to satisfy. Uh, all of that can be found uh, on the Durham uh, website. I'm happy to share that link uh, if, you, if you want me in, in, in the chat afterwards as well. 
So there are a variety of uh, scholarship opportunities, and I have taken the time to go through this uh, long list uh, and uh, draw out the scholarships that are most relevant for most of uh, Indian students. That is the Shavening Scholarship, where uh, they generally open in mid-September uh, and close in early November. There's the Commonwealth Master's Scholarship, which uh, opens in mid-November and closes mid-December. And there is the Durham University International Scholarship, which is a, a, a scholarship that is open all year round uh, that you uh, can apply to. There's a variety of other scholarships that are more specific to uh, specific ethnic backgrounds, nationalities, uh, or, or gender backgrounds that you can find on the website. So take a screenshot of, of this slide um, and you can look at the URL to find uh, more scholarships. If you want to know more about our programs and in particular read about uh, the field trips that are available in some of these programs, what the day in the life of a student looks like, but maybe also see what is going on in the department by looking over our Twitter X feed, etc. feel free to visit our, um, our website. If you type into Google uh, SCIA, S-G-I-A Durham, uh, you can get our webpage fairly quickly. And there you will find a link to postgraduate taught programs, which will give you an overview and more detailed information about uh, those programs. The MSc public policy is not yet there, but it will be there later this year. Good, um, that ends uh, this short presentation. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. And I look forward to answering uh, your questions. Thank you so much for answering all the questions so well. I will help you call up the question from the YouTube chat box. So the first question is, what distinguishes the MA International Relation Program from the MA Politics and International Relation Program? Yes, that's a good question. So the distinction really has to do with the theory side. As I've shown you on the slide, the MA International Relations is really just international relations focused, right? So it doesn't have a particularly strong theory background. There is a module called International Relations Theory, but it focuses at the international level and the relationship between states and how that is structured and theorized. The international, uh, the MA Politics and International Relations Political Theory is a bit broader as you can see by the structure, it has an international relations element, but it also has a political theory and political thought element. And that really kind of goes not just at in the states, but goes into questions of like what is legitimate, what is good, what is ethical, what is moral, which goes at across the levels from the very local to the very global that talks about how do we redistribute resources? Um, how do we solve certain moral dilemmas? Uh, what are the guiding moral ethical principles that are used to resolve these dilemmas and how they vary across different international contexts? So to some extent, the MA Politics and International Political Theory Program is, is broader because it kind of incorporates international relations and political thought and political theory. And the MA International Relations is very, international relations focused uh, and doesn't have a political thought element per se. Okay, so next question is, could you please elaborate on the coursework and research opportunities available in the MA International Relations European program? Yes, so uh, the, the, the resources uh, at Durham are, are quite extraordinary. We have an extremely well-staffed uh, library uh, and all of uh, our course resources we try to make available online. So in your module, you will have a virtual learning environment in which there is a link to a reading list where your key readings and your additional readings are listed that you can click and access through your Durham credentials uh, through the library. Uh, the library is also a great resource to go into the stacks to find additional readings, etc. Uh, and the way that uh, courses generally work is in terms of lectures and seminars. So the lectures are uh, where everyone in the course comes together. So that could be around 40, 50 people 
uh, where we do a, a lecture, uh, a more frontal oriented teaching in, in, interspersed with group activities, this active learning based approach that I've mentioned. And then there are the seminars which we intentionally limit to 15 students, which are really there to discuss uh, the, the, the part of the lecture and the more detailed readings that you have been doing and how these things are uh, debated uh, in, in the literature. Does that cover both aspects? I, the, the first one I might have missed, you, meet, you might need to repeat that one again. I'll repeat the question again. Could you please elaborate on the coursework and research opportunities? Okay, so coursework um, will involve you doing uh, preparatory readings for the lectures, but also readings for the seminars. And then we generally have two types of assessments. So there is the formative assessment and the summative assessment. The formative assessment allows you to kind of train and experience how the summative assessment will work. So it allows you to kind of draft the first policy brief or kind of uh, do a presentation to see how well you've understood the material and get feedback from the lecture. Uh, etc. And the summative assessments are the exams or the, the assessments, the writing, the presentations, the podcasts, the mapping, etc. that count towards your degree uh, classification. So you will get a mark uh, on those, a scale of from zero to 100, and that will count towards your mark of that module and the degree classification. Uh, how comp competitive is the scholarship application process? So scholarships are always uh, competitive. There are lots of students that would like to come to Durham. There are lots of students that want a scholarship. Uh, the Shevening scholarships and the uh, other scholarship, let me just quickly remind myself what they're called. The uh, Commonwealth Master Scholarships are not just for Indian students. They're for all um, you know, Commonwealth country students, as well as the, the Shevening Scholarship, which I think is even wider. So they are they are very, very competitive. Um, the Durham University Scholarship is also available to everyone that applies to Durham University. Uh, so itself is also competitive. I don't have exact numbers that I can share with you on this, but um, they are competitive, very competitive by the nature uh, of, you know, supply and demand. Uh, can students apply for scholarships for multiple programs simultaneously? Yes, you can apply for multiple programs and you can apply for multiple scholarships, as far as I know. Um, we will give you um, all offers to which uh, you bring the necessary qualifications and you can choose which uh, offer to accept. You cannot accept more uh, than, than one offer. Uh, what is the scope of MSc conflict and peace building? What do you mean exactly with scope? So the, the scope in terms of geographical scope is not limited. There are colleagues that work um, on uh, Southern, Southern Europe uh, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in the program. There are also colleagues that work in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and there are colleagues that work in the context of Southeast Asia and East Asia in, in that program. Uh, so at the moment, we have a field trip that is going on in, in Armenia, um, and we have a, a colleague that is teach, teaching a CPD um, or taught a CPD earlier this, this term uh, that focuses on, on the Middle East. So geographically, it's, it, it's, it's very open and will depend on the availability of academic staff in that area that bring the necessary expertise. In terms of the... Um, Theoretical or substantive sc scope, uh, it is broad as well. It is multidisciplinary. So you will be confronted with theories and explanations and empirical insights from law, anthropology, politics and international relations, uh, but also sociology and, and geography. And there are staff from all of these different areas both within the school, but also outside of the school in the anthropology department and the law department that will teach and interact with you. Uh, could you please uh, provide more information about the specific course areas within the MA politics and international relation 
political theory program? So there are um, a variety of, of, of courses. Uh, so let me pick maybe one or two to kind of uh, explain in some more detail. So the international organization course is a course that gives you an insight over how these international organizations have developed historically. What are the principles, the, 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 the processes that have created them? How do they affect the types of decision and the working of these organizations um, today? And what are the limits that they are facing due to a variety of global challenges and the changing nature of international relationships today? So this module is really something that covers different international organizations from the UN, ASEAN, Mercosur, the EU, uh, across the globe. It looks at how these different international organizations work, relate to each other, how they help or don't help structure problems. It's very empirically uh, descriptive and contemporary oriented. The uh, international relations theory module is about the theoretical questions of international relations. So how do states interact in an anarchic system? What does responsibility uh, mean? What is the role of human rights? Why should we have human rights? How are they upheld when there isn't a world government uh, that can kind of enforce and secure these, these rights? What does it mean to be responsible in the international uh, system? How do we legitimize international uh, violence, conflict, uh, et cetera. Uh, the ideologies and political thought as well as contemporary political philosophy modules, they are really political theory modules. So again, similar to the IR theory module, it asks normative questions of what is good, what is right, what should be done, but it doesn't ask them at the international level per se, but it asks them at uh, local more individual levels that has, of course, implications for uh, the international sphere. So the contemporary political philosophy covers an analytical um, philosophy approach, looking at moral dilemmas, uh, talking about things like um, Rawls theory of justice and fairness. Uh, how can we decide whether a rule or an, an approach or a distribution is fair or unfair? What should that basis be? How do we make these decisions. Um, and the ideologies and political thought looks at how have people thought about politics and power and international relations throughout time in different areas of the world. Not just you know the Western political thought, but also the Eastern political thought and the African political thought about how relationships, politics, how people and human beings, groups solve their, their conflicts uh, and interests. Okay, so I've covered all the questions from the YouTube chat box. Thank you for answering all the questions so well. Do you want to share any final words? Um, no, I don't have any final things to share. Uh, I mean, the only thing that I might want to uh, point out again is uh, the, the email address of, of the school. So let me share uh, my screen here. Um, and make this slightly larger so that everyone can see it. Uh, the email address of, of the school is politics.department at durham.ac.uk. If you have any questions that come to mind later after this uh, webinar, feel free to email us. They will come to me or we, they will be sent to the program directors of these different programs and they will get back to you uh, with any questions, uh, any answers to your to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone, for your valuable time. All the audience, if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact the SIUK India office. For more update, do follow us on our social media handles. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.